Hello everyone, my name is Deanna Sethi, I'm working with the Balfour Project and I'm joined today with, um, by Gillian Mosley, Robert Cohen and Tim Llewellyn. Uh, Tim is on the executive committee of the Balfour Project, Robert Cohen is from the Amos Trust and Gillian Mosley is the director of the film you just saw, The Tinderbox. So um, first of all, if you don't mind, I'm just going to quickly say a word about the Balfour Project. Um, the Balfour Project is involved in trying to get Britain to acknowledge its historic and continuing responsibilities to uphold equal rights for the Israeli and Palestinian peoples through popular education and advocacy, um, to persuade the British government to recognize the state of Palestine along the state, alongside the state of Israel. And um, we do regular events. Some of you may have come along to our monthly webinar series. So uh, please do check out our website for our upcoming ones. We've, um, we will be posting about them in the chat box that you can see. And if you have any questions, please post them in the chat box and I will relay them to our dear panelists. So um, I would like to thank Dartmouth Films for um, hosting this event today and taking care of all the tech sides. So thank you very much to Dartmouth Films. And so let me introduce our panelists. We've got Gillian Mosley, who, as I said, she's the director of the film you just saw. And um, she has a strong passion for making films of, with a social purpose as you've just witnessed. Um, her interest in independent film, and uh, she has an interest in independent film and the, its ability to tackle difficult subjects in potentially game-changing ways. And uh, The Senior Box is her directorial debut and has already won several awards, so we're very proud of her. Uh, we're joined today by Robert Cohen, who's a trustee of the Amos Trust. And um, they work on several issues but have um, a focus, uh, one of their focuses is on justice in Palestine. So very much alongside the ethos and the goals of the Balfour Project. So we welcome you today, Robert. And um, he has got a career in the BBC where he spent many, many years working in the newsrooms. And like him, Tim has also got a background working for the BBC. He was the Middle East correspondent in Beirut and in Nicosia. Um, he's been a freelancer for the BBC and other publications and has written a book called The Spirit of the Phoenix, um, Beirut and the Story of Lebanon. So we are very honored to have you all joining us today. <laughs> and um, I would like to start by asking Tim and Robert if you wouldn't mind saying a few words on um, what you thought, what thoughts you had on the film, The Tinderbox. Robert, do you want to go first? Hey, yes, I mean, I want to congratulate uh, Gillian, first of all, on, on making a brilliant film. Um, it's not easy to tackle this subject, as I think um, everybody watching this will know. And as Gillian has no doubt um, experienced in putting all this together. Uh, but I think, I think you've done it brilliantly. And I, and I think sort of the things that really stood out for me were, first of all, how well you brought out um, Britain's involvement in this story. And that, that's, I think, particularly relevant for the Balfour Project. Uh, and, I, and that's something which I think most people in this country just don't know about. You know, they've just, either they've never learned this history, I think that's the most likely option, or they've, or they've forgotten it. But it means that the whole subject of, of Israel-Palestine is, is far more relevant than people perhaps uh, realise that, that it is to the UK. And I think that came out really strongly. And, um, and the other thing that uh, really impressed me was just the way that you kind of dehumanised all the um, all the people that you were talking to, uh, whether it was the you know the the settler or whether it was the the Palestinian voices or, or the kind of liberal Jewish Israeli voices, um, you, you, you can even if you didn't agree with them, uh, you still felt okay. This is a human being, and they've got a perspective, and they've got a narrative, uh, and and there's a there's a there's a sense which you have to, you have to understand that and respect it. And I thought that all came through uh, really strongly. So. Congratulations, and I hope um, I hope a lot of people see the film because uh, people need to understand this story um, a lot better than I think most people do. Thank you, <laughs> Julian. Yes, um, I totally agree with everything that Robert just said. Um, one rather strange thing I'm going to say is that I'm sorry that this film, or something much more much along the same lines as your film, uh, wasn't made and shown about 40 or 50 years ago, because what the film actually brought out, I think, uh, with your gentle interlocution, 
you're understanding, but not appearing to know any of the answers, but searching them out. What, what, appear, what appeared to me to come out so well uh, were the complexities of the issue and how there are no easy answers to it. But you gave both sides of the story. And that was something that, as I say, 50 years ago, um, there was no Palestinian side to the story. In the late 1960s, mid up until the, I'd say probably when I started working in the Middle East in the mid 70s, there had been very little documentary work shown on screen or on television, uh, showing the, the true nature of this terrible situation that obtains in Israel and Palestine. Um, I'm glad you made it now, but it would have been nice to have had this kind of examination, this display um, done a long time ago. And it would, have, it would have stopped, I think, the one narrative, which used to be the Israeli narrative, being dominant for so long. What you did is you brought out both stories of both people and showed how um, deeply they're felt. Um, but I, I'm sure in answer to questions later on, we'll come to some of the... So you did make some observations. You let your feelings show in one or two places. But it was a very gentle, very well-made film. And I'd, I'd like to say thank you for it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I would like to add that not only did you get the different sides, but you've managed to get some voices that we don't typically hear, um, the Christian Palestinians and the young Israelis. And that was really um, interesting to get different perspectives and not just typical. Uh, yes, I like the man from Haifa. I like the Jewish guy from Haifa, the metal um, rocker. Yes. He'll be from Orphan Land. Interesting <laughs> character, came at it from both sides. Thank you. Um, so, Gillian, what was it that inspired you to make the film in the first place? You talked a little bit about it during the film. Um, um, I think there were several things going on. First of all, um, as, as really both Tim and, and Robert uh, alluded to, um, there are some pretty strange ideas in circulation about what, what this story is actually about. And um, this is even odder because the verifiable facts are, are actually pretty easy to lay your hands on if, if you're willing to do the research and read books and what have you. But I couldn't, re I couldn't find a film that had done it, certainly not you know, you know, in the last four or five decades. As, as Tim points out. Um, and given that the situation just seems to escalate and get worse and worse and worse, it, it occurred to me that it would be a really good thing if in public circulation and hopefully prominently, uh, there was a film, um, albeit a 90 minute film that would en enable the wider public to understand what, what has gone on um, in order to then go on and make up their own minds. So I think that was that was my main uh, my main goal. But you know, adjacent to that, I also wanted to try and make a film that I felt could make a difference. And rightly or wrongly, in this space, most of the films that I see and often love are um, they sort of belong in echo chambers. And again, I wanted to try and make a film that would get out of the echo chambers, or at least had the possibility to get out of echo chambers. Thank you so much. Um, right, so we've got some questions coming in already from the audience. So please do, if you have a question, post them in the chat box and they will be relayed to us. Um, we've got a question to, I think to all of you, I'm gonna direct it. Are the reports by Yeshtin, Betselem and Human Rights Watch alleging that Israel is engaged in apartheid game changers um, are they game changers or will they be buried? And P.S. Jillian's film is wonderful. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> That's part of the question, but also my personal opinion. Um, Robert, do you want to go first with that one? Uh, yes. I mean, um, it's hard to know whether whether these sort of recent reports will be game changers, but they're they're certainly having an influence on on the discourse. Um, the public discourse around Israel-Palestine. Uh, I mean, the Beit Salem report that came out in January was, was kind of largely um, um, ignored in terms of the kind of global mainstream media, but the, the Human Rights Watch report certainly wasn't, uh, and that really did get some traction. Uh, and, and what I've seen 
uh, in the last, uh, even the last few weeks, in fact, you know, through the, the, the latest flare up that we've seen uh, during May, is that you could see how particularly the, the use of the word apartheid is becoming seemingly more acceptable, more mainstream. Uh, you just hear people using it in, in a way that you didn't even 12 months ago. Uh, and, it, and I just get the sense that people are kind of feeling um, emboldened, more, more, more confident, more able to uh, use that kind of uh, description, which has been highly controversial and you know, highly contested um, in the past. And now it feels like it's becoming part of the uh, acceptable language. Uh, and that's happened very quickly. Um, so you know, whether it's a game changer or not is, is, a, is another matter. But what I am seeing is this widening of the acceptable political discourse and the language that can be used. And that's absolutely a consequence of, 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 of all these recent reports. Yes. Uh... I, I think that one of the one of these this, this question about apartheid is an interesting one, because um, the fact that apartheid is now used that's been quite freely uh, in Israeli society itself uh, by um, recently by two friends of ours on the Biafra project, two former Israeli ambassadors to South Africa who, who work with us sometimes. Uh, the fact that it is is being used is interesting because I think five six years ago people would have been very tentative about even talking about that phrase in connection with Israel. And it's, it, it's been the same with various other um, phrases or usages over the past 10 years. For instance, the one state solution. Now, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, the, I, I'm not advocating this or not, but I'm just saying that the, the, the idea of a one state solution uh, would have been, you know, you were laughed out of court normally by both sides. Palestinians wouldn't have it, except for one or two intellectuals, and the Israelis certainly weren't having it. Now it's part of the language on both sides. So it, it's what I think this seems to indicate is how the, the the conversation moves on. What's allowed to be said moves on. Concepts that were regarded as completely out of order very short time ago, especially in the United States, not so much in Israel, but in the United States, are now very much part of the public debate. And even in the New York Times and, and organs that were noted for their uh, more or less uh, total support for Israel. So I, I, th I think, you know, be because this is such an intractable issue, and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere but backwards at the moment, the, the only thing we can hope for is for the language and the debate to move on. And hope that somehow, you know, the political, the political forces uh, around us will eventually move with it. It sounds pathetic, but I mean, I think that's all we can do at the moment. And yeah, all I can do is is really agree with what's been said and say, uh, you know, while I have felt for a long time, sort of 10, 20 years, that the situation is pretty intractable, this last three to six months, it has felt like um, alongside Betselem, there have been a couple of things that represent movement in that um, more of the Palestinian side of the situation has managed to get into the mainstream. So as Tim just mentioned, you know, I've, I've just been in the States and seeing in the New York Times reference to Sheikh Jarrah as a um, contributing factor to the recent violence was something I, I really never thought I'd see. And in fact, um, as Tim said, this, this story was on the front pages of the New York Times for a, you know, a good week plus and not just giving the Israeli side. So all of this is, is pretty interesting um, alongside you know, the B'Tselem and Human Rights Watch reports. Um, one question for Tim. I'm going to aim this one at you, Tim. Uh, can you explain why the elections have not taken place for many years in Palestine and how it can be resolved that ele the elections will take place soon? Ah, well, this doesn't, this doesn't have much to do with Gillian's film. Uh, but um, I, 
I think the answer to this is there's been a, a, an enormous lack of enthusiasm on the part of the present leadership of the Palest Palestinian Authority to have elections because they're deeply unpopular. And it's been very physically difficult to organize elections. The Israelis have been very much against it. Uh, and therefore, there's been a kind of state of stasis, political status in the Palestinian movement. Fatah itself is very divided between different sectors. Um, the whole West Bank, of course, is divided within itself, and it's divided from Gaza, which makes organizing any kind of coherent political campaigning virtually impossible. And East Jerusalem is another factor where the Israelis have, have not in previous times allowed elections and said they weren't going to this time, although there are methods by which the Palestinians in East Jerusalem could vote. But it seems that the, the, this time, this, when it looked as if elections might be about to happen, um, the, the recent wave of disturbances right throughout the territories and through Israel itself um, made, made it physically impossible. And I suspect that Mahmoud Abbas breathed a sigh of relief. But I mean, I think the basic answer is that there, there are terrible political divisions and a sort of paralysis. The Palestinians, you know, are not organized well. They have nothing that they can really see there to believe in. Some of them, one of their best possible leaders is in jail. Um, you know, they, they are in a, a, a state of total isolation politically. This is one of the interesting things about this, this kind of outburst of um, different situations in Gaza, Sheikh Jarrah, the old city, and inside, and inside Israel itself, was that it brought the Palestinians together as a, as a unit for the first time that I can remember, really. I mean, I won't go into the whole history of the, of, of the Palestinian Israelis, but they were for a long time regarded as very separate entity from the rest of the, from the, from the occupied territories. This crisis seemed to bring the Palestinians together. Uh, and you, if you talk to Israelis now, you'll hear them saying, you know, that we, we can't, the occupation isn't the problem. We have to go back to 48 to, to get at the roots of this problem, to, to the problem of the refugees, the Nakba, the, the, the coexistence of Israelis and Palestinians. So um, I think in a sense, that was a great political move ahead for the Palestinians that they showed this kind of cross-border unity. And it's, Tim, it seems to be happening um, at that kind of grassroots level, doesn't it? So it's sort of, you're seeing this unity and solidarity across the Palestinian communities that it's it sort of in, in spite of the leadership rather than because of the leadership. Um, and, it, and, it, and it's sort of interesting to see uh, that the media understands often that it needs to be talking to sort of grassroots civil society Palestinian leaders um, to really get a grasp of what the dynamic is and what's actually playing out here, rather than speaking to the Palestinian Authority or, or to Hamas. Well, this is a familiar problem with the media, isn't it? They don't talk to ordinary people. They talk to, they talk to political bosses and insiders. And then they find out, you know, as we've just done with Brexit, that it's all too late. And um, if, if I may, I'd just like to bring this back to the film, because as the film highlights, this, of course, is the problem from the Palestinian side from the beginning. Um, you know, they, they just were unable to muster a unified, cohesive defence that was capable of... Um, you know, of dealing with the onslaught that came at them. And, you know, that for me is, is one, of, one of the things that makes me saddest about this story. And I would love to see that. That was one of the things I wanted to ask you about, Gillian. It's one, one area where I slightly took issue with you was that I thought you were implied, and I may be wrong about this, that in the, 19, the early 1920s, it was, it was the divisions amongst the Palestinians that have been the prime been a prime contributor to their political um, demise or lack of strength. But I think the British played an enormous part in making that possible, uh, and by cooperating with the Zionists in the, in the very earliest days of the mandate, so that the Zionists were able to get on with their program, uh, and the Palestinians were 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 not were not allowed access to any democratic process. 
No, I, I absolutely. And I, I think I did, you know, I'm sorry if, it, if you got that impression, but I think I did say that the Palestinians didn't have access. So, so that was certainly, you know, a key issue. But, you know, they, they did also have, there was a division between the civil administration and the, um, I think it's the religious, sorry, I uh, should have notes in front of me. Um, so that you had, um, you had these two really important um, parts of Palestinian life. Um, you know, overseen by different groups of people. And I don't think that helped. Having said that, you know, Chaim Weitzman, who in the end didn't make it into the film in name, was unbelievably successful at getting British ministers to take him seriously and to propel Zionism into uh, the forefront of British policy. And, you know, again, the film was 90 minutes and we took a, a, an hour and a half of history out of this, but you know, Britain's, it, it cannot be un, overemphasized how dubious uh, some of Britain's reasoning behind supporting this was. And it certainly wasn't because they were, you know, all they wanted was for the Jews to have a, 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 a Jewish homeland. There was an awful lot more very cynical uh, British geopolitics going on behind that decision. Um, but I, I don't think we, we disagree, Tim. I think it's, oh, okay. you know, perhaps, Thanks. yeah, it just got lost somewhere. Um, Gillian, I've got a question for you um, that was sent in advance. Have you had any backlash since making the film, whether from family members or any other sources? So we, we this is this is our first official uh, preview screening and so all that's happened so far with the film in large part is um, festival screenings and a couple of very tiny private screenings so it hasn't really been anywhere where that would be um, something that would happen having said that I have screened it um, while I was making it I screened it for a, a wide array of academics and people with a vested interest and I have been screened at uh, by Jews. Um, I have been told by Palestinians that um, they can't support the film because it normalizes relations. Um, in terms of my own family, all my um, liberal family members have seen it and liked it. Um, I do have a fairly large contingent of right-wing American Zionists in my family and none of them have watched it yet. So that is to come. <laughs> Are you going to do a big screening for them? I've, I've sent one of them, the, the, the one least likely to scream at me, a link, but um, haven't, haven't heard anything. So, well, I think we all wish you luck with that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> right. So we've got the questions alternate between sort of politics and the film and so forth. So I'm going to take um, one I think I'm going to aim this one at you, Robert. Um, do you think that if the terrorist sides of the battle were removed uh, from both sides, I presume they're talking about, um, that there might be an easier way to find peace with both people and enable self-determination? Sorry, if, the, if what was the beginning of the question? If what was removed? If the terrorist sides of the, battles, of the battle were removed, that there might be an easier way to find peace with both people and enable self-determination. I'm not actually sure if they mean the terrorist sides on both sides, but that's uh, something they have. Okay, um, I, um, I, I think I understand. I mean, I, I, I don't. This, 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 and this kind of goes back to something Tim, Tim was saying earlier. I don't think that this situation will will be resolved while it stays at the level of. Um, you know, blaming Hamas rockets for um, every, everything that's going wrong, and you, and you kind of hear that uh, that kind of political rhetoric um, a great deal, not not only from sort of sort of pro-Israel advocates, um, but you know, but also from um, um, leaders of Western nations around the world, and certainly in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, but you no, know, Israel has the right to defend itself, and Hamas should not be firing rockets. And as long as the debate stays at that level. Um, it won't. It won't move forward. There won't be any progress at all. Um, and 
Israel, I would say, the onus, I think, is on um, Israel because it holds the power in this situation. You know, I think you always have to understand the power dynamic going on in any situation to be able to think about you know, how, how do you move it forward. Uh, and the reality is that is Israel holds all the cards here, that they are the occupying power. Um, they, 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 are, they have a, 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 uh, a very strong military. They have the global sort of superpower support from the United States uh, and, and indeed from other Western allies. Um, and, and until that power dynamic is, is understood, um, things won't change. And, and, and also until there is, I think, a fundamental acceptance that we need to be thinking about um, equal rights. You know, let's, let's set aside questions about one state or two states or however many states um, until we can get fundamental agreement about, well, shouldn't all the people within this territory be treated equally and fairly? Um, I'm not, I, know, I can't see how uh, the, the conversation will ever move forward. So I think to sort of frame it in terms of, well, if, if it, you know, it's, it's the terrorists or the extremists on both sides, I think that kind of misses the point. And I think we have to step back and, and ask some bigger questions, recognize the power dynamics, understand the history better, um, and realize that unless there is a dialogue, um, that, that, you know, that there, this, these kind of flare ups, will, it'll just happen again. You know, it'll happen either later on this year or in a few years time, but it will definitely happen again. Yeah, I mean, you know, it should also be said, you know, if there were proper, meaningful, equal human rights, civil rights, would there even be a role for Hamas? Um, you know, I think it would be interesting for people to wrap their uh, their minds around that question as well. Thanks for that. Um, Gillian, I've got a fun question for you, I hope. Um, <laughs> who would you have in your dream audience for this film? And Robert, Tim, if you can think of some uh, contribution. Uh, okay, well, there are um, obvious ones like uh, Obama, Joe Biden, um, I don't think I can bring myself to say Boris Johnson. Um, and on the other side, um, it is a fantasy of mine to sit on a stage with Melanie Phillips and debate this issue with her. Uh, that's probably me being very perverse, but I, I think we have got to start having conversations with people who, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, can continue to propagate really propagandistic and um, propagandistic view of this situation that is actually very easy to pick apart. So I would like some of those as well. But, you know, anybody with the power to actually make change uh, would be great. And everybody who is interested. By the leader of our opposition. Well, the leader of our opposition happens to be my MP, and it will not surprise you to know that he has had at least five emails from me trying to get, get some engagement on this subject. Uh, thus far, with no luck whatsoever, I'm hoping that in-person surgeries will start again soon so I can just go and sit in one um, until I get to see him. Robert, anyone you would invite to a screening of the Tinderbox? Um, I, I think I would just I'd just like to see young people watching it. You know, if it was if it if it could just be more you know accessible for you know, secondary school kids learning modern history, um, I, I I think it would be invaluable uh, as a as an introduction to to a topic that is often presented as just being oh you know it's so complicated and, and it's so difficult to understand and and you know you can't open your mouth because you're frightened that somebody will call you anti-Semitic. Um, I, I I'd just like to see the the upcoming generation, uh, who I think um, are very interested in these kind of difficult issues, um, given the chance to kind of understand, you know, what 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 is the background to it, and in particular, what's the involvement of Britain? You know, because as I was saying before, I just think that's so poorly understood, and I think the film does such a good job in making people realise um, the British history in all of this. So that that, that would be my vote: um, young people, teenagers. Yeah, um, I think we... there's, a, there's a sort of um, assumption on the part of British members of parliament and British ministers 
um, that <clears throat> we don't really have any say in this. It's all America's job to put pressure on if Israel if it wants to. Um, we don't we don't really have any part in this. And we're not very powerful. And it's, it's complete avoidance tactics because Britain actually is influential in this, in this matter, not just because it started it in a sense um, by the Balfour Declaration and what followed from that, but also because we are, these, if you go to Israel, uh, the Israelis take Britain very seriously, partly because we were the authors of the Balfour Declaration. They do take what the Europeans uh, uh, think very seriously and we do have a role to play in this most of israel's trade is with britain and the other european nations israel sees itself as a european country i mean so for the british to try and get out of this by somehow saying well it's all america's lap i think is that's a political cowardice and i think julian's film we should come back to julian's film it's very good for laying out in a very graphic but not dictatorial way what's wrong the civil rights equal rights thing came through very obviously. And you could also see that Gillian was uneasy with some of the things that she was being told. She didn't make a big fuss about it, but she was uneasy. I think I'm right in saying that. She didn't, she was like the innocent abroad in a way, um, being shocked by what was, what was going on, but a, a quite knowing innocent. Um, and I also like the fact that you didn't try to come to any conclusions. It became obvious in the film what was wrong. And that's the inequality of life between one side and the other, the power that one has and the power that the other lacks. And I thought that all came up, welled up very nicely from, from your film. And I, I wish we could, I'd like to follow up that schools thing because uh, you know, the Balfour Project is trying to get involved more and more in education, especially secondary school education. So it, it might be that we could organize that film to be shown to you know, um, that, that kind of audience. Following on from that, I would add teachers to the list because yeah. as the project um, that we're working with, the Balfour Project with education, we are getting a lot of feedback from teachers who would love to teach this topic. It's on the curriculum in a lot of cases, but they don't have the confidence to address it themselves. They're worried about the fact that it's so controversial and what if they get questioned and so forth. So hopefully things like your film, Gillian, will make um, will give teachers the confidence to be able to approach the subject. And the fact that you're, you're Jewish and you allow the Jews to give their, their viewpoints fully in the film without harrying them, um, I think that, that helps to douse the fears of, you know, this anti-Semitism thing, which, which Robert mentioned, which of course is a, big, is, is a big problem for us in Britain at the moment, I mean, having a free and, free and fair debate. Exactly. Um, we are posting in the chat box, um, thanks to Wayne from Dartmouth Films, um, all of our upcoming events and also the links to the Amos Trust and the Balfour Project. So if you want to contribute, um, if you want to get involved, if you want to learn more about the work of the different organizations. Um, but I think I'm going to end on a final question for Gillian. Um, first of all, thank you again for making such an amazing film that we will all find very, very useful. Um, so my question to you is, um, I know that there's going to be lots of people that have watched the film today who want to share it with friends or, or want to tell people about it. Where will it be? I know it's very difficult with the restrictions and so forth, and I have no idea how they're lifting in terms of cinemas and whatnot. Um, but where will it be available in the future for people to watch if they want to recommend it to people? Um, well, this is uh, the first of a number of preview screenings that we have planned, although I have to say your, your timing is perfect because it's just before everybody disappears over the summer. And um, it seems that everyone we've been talking to has decided it's not a great idea to hold such a screening over the summer uh, virtually. So um, the next ones will most likely be um, in September, October. Um, and assuming these go well, we hope to find ourselves in a cinema near you at some stage. And that, that would be, um, you know, really when I need people to start talking about the film and sending their friends along. And I would also encourage you to look at our website and please, you know, email me through the website. Uh, it's uh, the tinderboxfilm.com. Um, and on, on our website are also ways that you might start getting involved if you're um, excised about the situation and feel like writing to your MP or whatever. There are some suggestions about 
what what you might how you might go about it what you might want to say um but yeah keep in touch via the website that's probably the the best piece of advice for now and if you are a uh, subscriber to the balfour project mailing list i'm sure we will send oh. out an alert when and, when it does go into cinemas so sorry that's that's for the uk and i should also say we have a different international distributor who uh, and, and so we'll be doing some 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 of these events in other countries as well uh, we've got one in america coming up in about 10 days time uh, but we're also working on holland france germany and switzerland right now um, and then I hope you will be seeing this on your television screens, you know, pretty much in any country you live in. Um, Fantastic. So we'll all keep an eye out for that. Um, I want to thank the audience for coming along um, and for staying with us. It's quite late in the night in the UK, so thank you. And I want to thank Robert for joining us, Tim as well, and Gillian, of course. Huge thank you for making such an important piece of work. And um, what we would ask is that everyone goes and tells everyone about it so that they can keep an eye out and watch it and it can be spread far and wide because it is very important and it was done so well and um, we're very proud of you. So thank you very much. Well, thank you to all of you and to everyone who's watch, watching. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.